I'm Martin from Genot Labs, and I'd like to talk about our uh, custom kernel approach. Um, and the talk is structured the following way. In the first chapter, I'd like to talk about uh, how, what motivated us to uh, create our own uh, kernel. In the second chapter, I give a little overview about uh, general uh, qualities of this kernel and how it works in general. Uh, and in chapter three, four, and five, I will go into detail about some features of the kernel. And yeah, let's start with the motivation. Um, one big advantage of Gnode is that you can run it of uh, various uh, kernels uh, like Nova, like the L4, uh, L4 kernels, like SL4, or Linux, and so on. And that gives you a great <coughs> flexibility uh, in development and application of Gnode. Uh, so you can, uh, for instance, some kernels have a cool debugger uh, built in, and some kernels are uh, uh, specialized on security, like the SEL4 kernel. And so you can choose uh, in, uh, in the application and in the user applications. It doesn't matter which kernel you uh, use for, for, the basic, uh, for the basic features. And the second big advantage of uh, supporting uh, many kernels is that you have a lot of uh, different ways of testing uh, the, the system on top of it. So you have different timing, you have different scheduling, uh, you have, uh, in general, a different behavior uh, at the base. And so you can uh, uh, get much harder testing for your, uh, for your system on top. Yeah. Um, so, when you look at this combination, Gnode and the kernel, uh, it's normally the way that you have a, a microkernel that is developed uh, on its own and that aims for a comprehensive security concept. So, it uh, likes to be self-contained and mistrusts all that is on top of it. Uh, of course, this brings a little bit of problems with it because uh, you then have the core, Gnode's core component uh, that uh, has to bring these, uh, this paranoid uh, kernel perspective in line with uh, the Gnode API on top of it. And uh, the misery here is that uh, the core component of Gnode must be trusted anyway by all uh, components on top. So you uh, don't get, uh, um, yeah, you, you don't have uh, much advantage from this extra effort uh, you spend. In. So, um, of course, there are some drawbacks that come from this uh, aspect. Uh, first, you have to shape some concepts uh, uh, the way you like it to be. Uh, for example, um, on some kernels for asynchronous communication, you have, uh, uh, you have semaphores, uh, for instance, and uh, these semaphores must be uh, bent in shape to support uh, the asynchronous communication API that we use on Gnode, so the signals in, in, this, uh, in this instance. So um, the other thing is that uh, often work is uh, done redundantly. So um, the memory management, uh, for example, uh, must be done redundantly in, in the core because the Gnode API differs a lot from uh, that uh, memory management API uh, that kernels support normally. And uh, at some points, there are even deficiency that you uh, can't solve. So you have to work around it. Um, for instance, uh, capability delegation on some kernels, you have the problem that you have to remember capabilities at certain places where you normally wouldn't have to uh, uh, using the Gnode API, but you have to because uh, the kernel otherwise uh, uh, revokes the capability. So, um, yeah. Well, we came up with the idea of uh, creating our own kernel. This kernel should uh, trust core. Uh, because it's trusted anyway, as I said, and should be uh, completely tailored uh, to serve the needs of core. Um, and in that, it can be uh, reduced to a minimalistic library that is linked to core. 
and simply enables it to run directly on the hardware. Um, and having the, genome, uh, the, the kernel API, uh, you can also run the most critical parts of the system in a, a, simple, uh, in a, in a more simple manner uh, than, than in core. Uh, for instance, uh, core is a multi-threaded uh, uh, application, and, you, uh, and, and some things uh, are much easier if you are not multi-threaded, for, for example. So, um, let's talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit about uh, the, the kernel itself. Uh, the, the tasks behind the kernel API um, are at first uh, the exception vectors. Uh, setting up the exception vectors and uh, catching exceptions is, is the main task of the kernel. Um, then uh, doing the scheduling, uh, of course, uh, for the multiprotic components on top. Um, then the kernel controls the interrupts, of course, because it has the exception vectors. And it provides communication. Uh, in our uh, case, it's uh, only two communication channels. You have IPC and you have signals for synchronous and asynchronous communication. Um, then it supports capabilities. Uh, so you have uh, trusted capabilities on top, and you have local names in each p uh, protection domain uh, that can't be uh, misused. Um, and uh, it does cache and TLB maintenance uh, because on most architectures these are uh, privileged uh, operations. And last but not least, uh, it does virtualization uh, for the same reason as for cache and TLB maintenance. Uh, and because it has, has the exception vectors. Um, so, uh, the APA does, uh, that rises from uh, these tasks uh, is uh, pretty simple. Uh, you can see in the top row, uh, the, these are all uh, syscalls uh, that are core only. So only the core component of Gnode is allowed to do these syscalls uh, at all. And in, in the bottom row, you see uh, the, the public API of the kernel. So these uh, syscalls can be done by each uh, user. And you see these are uh, not uh, not many syscalls, uh, it's, it's 14 if I uh, counted right, and it's uh, mostly about uh, yeah, threads, uh, signals, uh, messaging, and some uh, capability uh, syscalls uh, to manage the capabilities in the local BD. And all, uh, uh, all the memory management you can see is uh, uh, the, the memory management uh, for, for the kernel. The, the, the new and delete uh, syscalls are all in the core only section. So, um, yeah. Uh, this brings me to the first quality of the kernel uh, that all dynamic memory uh, is accounted. Uh, because um, for each kernel object uh, that is created uh, in, on runtime, um, you have to put in some memory from the outside, so from core. Um, and in core, we have a, a good memory ma uh, management, and so this memory management reflects uh, the costs for the kernel objects uh, to the session quota on top of the Gnode API. So, uh, in, in general, uh, for each kernel object you create, uh, you have to pay as user. And uh, this brings with it that the kernel uh, can't, be, uh, can't run out of memory. And yeah, that's, and that's, a, uh, that's a big advantage of, of this kernel. And um, the other thing is that uh, this way, uh, the, the whole kernel is a mere uh, state machine. So you can keep it single-threaded. Uh, you uh, you don't have any uh, dynamic uh, uh, stuff that is created, and this uh, makes the kernel pretty small. It's uh, uh, really low complex, and all you do in the kernel uh, every time you're in the kernel, you are the only one that is in the kernel. So you are uh, really fast. You don't block. You are not interrupted, um, and uh, kernel passes get really fast in general. So, <coughs> uh, speaking about low complex, uh, I have a little picture here. Uh, normally, if you uh, 
on Gnode and you have uh, one of the third party kernels. Um, you have in the, in the basic setup, uh, say, core, the kernel, and the init component, and some bootstrap comp uh, tools on some kernels. You have at least uh, 30,000 lines of code that you have to trust uh, from every component uh, on top of it. And this is uh, already pretty small, but with, the, uh, with this kernel library approach, uh, we can reduce it to uh, about uh, 22,000 lines of code. Yeah. Um, about the hardware support of the kernel. Yeah, initially, um, the kernel was uh, developed on ARM 7. And so the most features it provides on, on this architecture, of course, uh, it it's, uh, provides uh, several boards. You can see it here, uh, like Freescale boards or uh, Exynos and, uh, yeah, uh, the OMAP4, for example. Uh -huh. And you have uh, various features that are supported, like uh, the ARM Trust Zone features, uh, multiprocessing, uh, virtualization, or FPU, or something like that. And of course, we also uh, support other uh, architectures. Uh, here are some of them, uh, like x86 uh, supported. Uh, the, the ARM, ARM6 uh, support we have for Raspberry Pi. And uh, recently, we ported it to uh, RISC-V. It uh, was done by Sebastian Zum. And uh, we also have a board for the Muen separation kernel, which is a project from Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, let's go into more detail. Um, first, I'd like to talk about the scheduling of this kernel. Um, we have scheduling normally on other kernels. <coughs> Uh, we have only absolute priorities uh, for scheduling, and the big problem that you have with absolute priorities is, of course, that if one of your components goes mad at some point, um, uh, the other components that have a lower priority are not executed anymore. Uh, so this is a problem we faced, uh, and we thought about uh, how, to, how to solve this in, in, in our custom kernel. And we thought that um, yeah, having only the priority, uh, like a quality uh, uh, value, is not enough. We have to have another value, uh, value that is like a quantity value for CPU resources. And we came up with uh, the quota, CPU quota. Uh, CPU quota is like a, um, a time size. You have a super period of 100%. Uh, currently, it is set to one second in our kernel, but you can configure it, of course. And uh, of this one second, now you can uh, uh, donate uh, uh, parts of it, you can donate slices of it to uh, the several components. And then there's the principle that uh, a component has only a priority if it also has quota. So if you're out of quota, uh, you <coughs> have no uh, priority and you get only scheduled round robin. Uh, and lo as long as there is a component that has a priority and quota, uh, it is scheduled uh, uh, in, uh, before the other components. So, okay, let's uh, look at our example from uh, before. Um, we have again our USB that goes mad at some point, and you can see that uh, in this super period, uh, it exceeds its uh, own quota by going mad, and then it's uh, scheduled out, and that's it. And then in the, these red uh, slices, you can see the scheduler goes to round robin, because there is no uh, component left that has, uh, uh, that has quota in this, uh, in this super period. So at the end of the super period, uh, all the quota gets reset, and there are again priorities. And then you start again with the USB because it got, has gone mad, and uh, then it exceeds its quota again and it's scheduled away. 
So uh, this is a nice way of keeping the system alive, even if you have a high priority, but, it, uh, uh, but going mad, yeah. Okay, um, another nice, nice thing about uh, the CPU resources is that uh, they can be distributed in a way uh, that uh, resources are normally distributed in Gnode. Uh, so you have uh, the parent of, uh, of a component tree that has uh, an, a specific amount of, of quota, of CPU quota, and to uh, fill uh, its children with life, uh, it can give them some of its quota. Uh, and these children can again, like uh, CLI uh, gives VirtualBox again a little bit of its quota, and so on, and so on. Yeah. So it's in the hands of the parents uh, how much quota their children get. And uh, the same is with the priorities. Uh, you have at the root uh, uh, of the tree, uh, the, the init has all priorities, uh, one to eight, and then can give uh, a sub-range of these <coughs> priorities to uh, its children, and so on and so on. OK. Um, let's talk about the capabilities a little bit. It's um, one, one cool thing about capabilities on the base HW kernel is that uh, the uh, capabilities get au uh, automatically created and translated. So normally, uh, when you, uh, uh, normally you get capabilities into your protection domain by uh, receiving IPC. And in this IPC message uh, are some local names of the other component that uh, sent me this, IP, uh, this IPC. But uh, I cannot use these local names of the other components. So uh, the kernel goes uh, ahead and uh, tries to translate these local names of the other protection domain to my own protection domain. Uh, so I can directly use them without looking up any object or, or, or something like that. And uh, so when I receive the message, uh, the, the local names that I have in this IPC message are already uh, fine for me. I can directly invoke them. Um, and it also, if, if the kernel now realizes, oh, there's, uh, there's a local name of the, the sender of the IPC that is not present in, in uh, there, there is no, uh, no uh, uh, counter uh, local name in, in the other uh, protection domain, so the kernel goes ahead and creates automatically one for me. So uh, yeah, I have no invalid local names when I receive the message. Yeah, and uh, this implicitly uh, uh, this, this implies that uh, you have no name diversity in your protection domain. So uh, if you have one object uh, in the kernel that you want to reference, you can uh, be sure that you only have one name in your protection domain for this object because they don't get duplicated. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Um, and one cool thing about it is that all costs uh, in, in the kernel that arises from uh, receiving uh, capabilities uh, gets accounted to my own protection domain session quota. So. The user, if it wants to receive capabilities uh, to its protection domain, has beforehand uh, uh, give the kernel some quota, to say, OK, you can use this quota for my capabilities. And as, uh, as soon as the kernel has the case that it likes to create some local names for me, it uh, takes some of this quota and creates it from it. And if the quota doesn't, uh, is not uh, sufficient for creating these local names, the kernel says no, and throws an exception, and says, uh, here, I have some capabilities I want to give you, but I have not enough quota. And then I can go ahead and give him some more quota and receive capabilities. So uh, this is, again, in, in line with the concept I talked about at the beginning, uh, that the kernel doesn't uh, uh, give, some, uh, give its own uh, memory for users, but it also, uh, always wants to be paid for, uh, for actions. Yeah. Um, uh, last but not least, a cool thing about uh, capabilities is that um, the kernel helps you with the lifetime management. It looks a bit, little bit complicated, but I will try to uh, explain it. Um, 
in general, if you receiving a new capability, um, the kernel has uh, to create a local name object. Yeah? I, I uh, talked about uh, this uh, in, at the last uh, slide, and it uh, has to use my quota for this. And of course, it's in my interest uh, to get rid of this local name object as soon as I don't need it anymore. And how to achieve this? Uh, um, the kernel helps me with this. Um, but there is a problem uh, because there is a transition phase. Uh, so when, when the uh, kernel has created the local object here, it has to send it to me. Uh, it it, it uh, moves this uh, this capability into my UTCP, for example, and then I have to receive it from the UTCP and create a, a local instance uh, and so on and start red counting and the whole lifetime management in the user land. But between these two points, uh, I have a phase where the local name object is already created, but it is, uh, it is not known to the user land. So if now uh, one thread in my uh, application receives the capability and uh, another uh, thread also receives it, and during the time that uh, this, this, this other thread uh, uh, demangles the, the capability from the UTCP, uh, the, the first thread starts to delay it, uh, it would be fatal to uh, uh, delay the local name. Uh, so the user land has to acknowledge when it has received the capability. And as uh, long as there is an acknowledgement I have to wait until the X runs. And then the other kernel does it to me, so the other thread does it to me. And then the kernel thinks, oh, okay, there's no more acknowledgement, and then I can really wait to know the name. So the whole lifetime is pretty easy and safe. Yeah. Uh, okay, talking about communication. Um, uh, this is uh, a short topic. Um, uh, first, about IPC. Uh, cool thing about IPC is on the basic W kernel that it implicitly delegates CPU resources. So, if you uh, imagine you have uh, these four components, it's uh, two components that use a terminal session. It's a simple uh, session where you can put in characters and uh, these characters go somewhere. Uh, and you have a multiplexer for the terminal session and a UART where you can print these characters that you put in uh, the, the terminal session. So if these uh, two terminal clients here above uh, start an RPC to their terminal uh, multiplexer, they give their IPC uh, resources to the terminal multiplexer. So the terminal multiplexer has all uh, its, its own the RPC, and then it does again an RPC to the UART uh, to process the own RPCs, and it gives away all these slices it has uh, for its own to the UART. So the UART now has a lot of uh, CPU resources to, uh, to uh, process its RPC and it's a lot of go back to their original components. So, yeah, again, about uh, signals, uh, the, the asynchronous communication channel. Uh, again, the kernel uh, helps here with the lifetime management. And here the problem is a little bit different. <coughs>
that uh, you have to manage. And uh, this user man uh, this, this user land uh, object is the signal context. It's like the type of signals uh, that, you, that you have different signals, uh, like a timer signal or something like that. For each type of signal, you have an, uh, an object to uh, know if a, if a signal arrives, uh, what type of signal is that. So in general, you have, uh, uh, again, a phase, uh, a sequence where, where the, the signal arrived. Uh, it's in my UTCB again. And I have to uh, update the signal context. Uh, so the, the user land uh, lifetime management is up to date. But uh, during, this, uh, during this time slice, it would be fatal if uh, another thread uh, uh, goes on and likes to kill the, uh, uh, likes to destroy the signal context. Uh, because uh, then the, the, the pointer that I got with the signal would be invalid. And yeah. And this is why the kernel at, uh, uh, has this uh, kill signal context uh, this call. And if another thread now comes and wants to delay the signal context, it does this kill syscall. And uh, uh, the kernel now knows, OK, this signal uh, like, uh, uh, is killed. But uh, it's uh, already, uh, it is, uh, it, uh, there's also an acknowledgment pending. So I have to wait. But I don't uh, accept any more submits for the signal. So the signal is dead. But uh, it's already there. Uh, it's, it's still there. And uh, as soon as the acknowledgment of the receiver uh, arrives, um, this, this kill syscall uh, of, the, of the main thread gets unblocked. And it can start destroying this uh, signal context without having any fear that uh, there is still a signal uh, implied. So the, the main advantage of this is that normally you would have uh, when, when you receive a signal, normally you would have to look up the signal context. You would have uh, uh, some data structure where all signal contexts are in, and you do a lookup on it uh, every time you, you, you have a signal to ensure that the signal context is still available, that it is still alive. And with this, uh, with this uh, um, system, you won't have to look up signals anymore. And so a signal, uh, <coughs> signaling in general, uh, I think gets more fast, uh, gets faster. Uh, yeah. OK. That's it for my point. Uh, maybe I have some questions. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to. Yeah? yeah? yeah. If I wanted to, uh, to play with this and just to check it out, I, I never work with yeah. this. What would I do? Yes, uh, of course. Um, you can see here uh, just the source code of Gino uh, available on, on GitHub. And then uh, there you have uh, a tool uh, for creating build views, uh, build directories. And in this build directory, you uh, would have to set the kernel, uh, there's a kernel variable. Uh, the, the build directories are architecture uh, dependent. So we have an x86 build directory, for example. And then you set the kernel variable to hw. Uh, that's the name of the kernel. And then uh, all you build in this build directory automatically gets built for Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe I can show it. So I have my repository for Gino and now I 
architecture. Yeah, I, I'm sure that it is in the architecture that is supported by the base HW component, of course. Uh, so it says uh, successfully created. And then I go to the directory, 76, 64. So, and now I have this, uh, this build uh, file. Where can I configure my building? And Yes, the kernel variable. Uh, you can you can set this uh, kernel variable also uh, temporarily. Yeah, if you do the make uh, later, you can also set it only for this one make call. But you can also set it in here. I can open here. Hw instead of Nova, and that's it. Um, I start the test like this here. And now it starts building the stuff. And you can see here that it builds uh, the, the kernel dependent library for the HW kernel. Yeah? Uh, we have some kernel dependent libraries that are linked against the generic binaries. So the binaries stay independent from the, from the kernel. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I forgot. I can also set. The, I, I enable multi-processing yeah. and yeah here it, uh, it compiles the kernel and yeah the core oh, it takes a little bit of time there is the kernel library Also, uh, start fancy tests, of course, but it would take a little bit longer. So, yeah. Okay. I hope this answers your question. Yes. Okay. It's not a question. It's a suggestion. You should definitely come up with a better name than this. Yeah, I thought about it a lot of time. <laughs> I, I thought about Something lots of fancy. different names, and then there was the point, I think everybody knows it, where <coughs> all uh, the other guys said, okay, we need a name, we need a name, and I, I don't have a name, and then they started, okay, let's come up with hardware, for, for, for example, and I said, okay, well, <laughs> take it. It's, it's not the coolest name, but uh, I think it's, uh, the, the kernel is not that, uh, um, yeah. It's not a, 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 an own standing component, yeah? You, uh, you, you don't, have, you don't have this popularity where the name is that much important. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's different for other kernels that are used without uh, any other system. Okay? Two quick questions about the scheduling and about the memory management. Yes. You can go back slide to the same uh, yes. where you explain the super period. I didn't get the red dots actually the yes. the red dots mean that they didn't get the time to process. They didn't get yes. the CPU time, right? Okay. Okay. Um, Why would they get the CPU time if the CPU, the super period is not over and there is time and there is not more period task? Yes. Processing. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. This is the super period, yes? Yeah. Uh, until here. And now you have uh, at the beginning uh, lots of processes that have a priority and a quota, and they use their quota yeah. like here. And uh, for example, for a foul play, at this point, uh, the quota for a foul play is uh, exceeded. Yeah, it, it has no more quota left for this super period. Yeah. So. Uh, no, no, uh, I, yeah, it's a little bit uh, complicated because uh, at this point you are already in the next super period, yes? Okay, uh, this shows uh, the quota for the next super period, yes. Uh, but for the last super period, uh, at this point, uh, the, super, uh, the, the quota is exceeded for FO play, yeah? And at this point, for audio, the, the quota is exceeded, and so on. So at this point, 
all components except the timer uh, um, have no more quota. So. Of course, you can only consume your quota uh, when you uh, when you're awake. Yeah? yeah. So this is why the the timer uh, still has quota left at the end of uh, the super period. Yeah, and the question about memory told that uh, any pending uh, acknowledgement yes. would make the kernel wait for the... the <coughs> no, delay. no, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. I, I, I said that the kernel would wait, but that's actually not true, because uh, the kernel only uh, sets the thread to wait. So if I do uh, this, uh, this delete... Uh, yeah, exactly. this delete happens in the kernel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's not like that. Okay. Uh, actually, it's like uh, it's it's when you do the delete syscall, and, uh, and yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a bad example because at this point uh, the, uh, nobody waits. Uh, the delete is uh, like a, a hint for the kernel only, and it directly returns. Uh, but for 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 signals, it's true. Uh, for signals. Uh, the kill syscall. Yeah, when you when you say I want to delete the, sig uh, the signal context, uh, and the kernel uh, realizes, okay, there's an acknowledgement pending, it blocks the thread. Yeah. So the thread doesn't return from the syscall, and at this point it returns. Okay. So, in the previous case, but but the kernel stays alive. Okay. And in the previous case, from the kernel perspective, can you go just like? Uh, um, well, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, where, where was it? Here. Yeah, here. In this case, you yes. said that, that from the kernel perspective, the delete won't happen until the acknowledgement comes. Yes. So from that perspective, it, it is uh, possible that the user space never sent this acknowledgement. What what uh, mechanism the kernel has to capture that? And yes. Uh, it's it's um, this delay has no effect. Yeah. The the, the, the kernel only realizes the Okay, uh, somebody wants to delete the cap, but there's, all, all, uh, there's still uh, a representation of the capability in, in, the, in the component, in, in the protection domain, but it has not uh, um, resolved it yet. So when it gets the acknowledgement, uh, the kernel uh, says, okay, now uh, the user then has the new local name, and then, it, uh, then the delete the, 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 the waits for the next delete. Maybe I'm not asking the question right, but what happens if that acknowledgement never comes and, and walk on name objects keep creating in the kernel? Is that, there a way for the problem. kernel to realize? That's no problem. Is wrong? Because this acknowledgement is called is only a help for the protection domain for the user. Oh. Yeah? Uh, if the user is not intelligent enough to do the acknowledgement, it's its own problem because its own uh, it's its own order that uh, is used for the local name object. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So I have another question which is related to management. Yes. So if I understand correctly, for instance, the file system is in one process or more processes, or several processes. Uh, but more generally, if if you have a process that needs you mean in, in case of the capabilities that yes. uh, that you have? Okay, so <coughs> um, each uh, protection domain has to pay for its own capabilities. So if yes. I'm a server mm -hmm. and I provide a session for clients, mm -hmm. and uh, over this session I receive capabilities from the clients, mm -hmm. I have to pay a server for this. I am willing to uh, spend some of my quota to fulfill the service I provide for the clients in this case. Okay. So I have to uh, spend some quota beforehand uh, b b before I say, okay, now I'm ready to receive uh, IPC messages. And if I don't and I get capabilities and the kernel throws an exception, then I can also uh, uh, then I can still decide whether I want to spend more quota for the client or not. It's in my own. Uh, it's, it's my own.
the server will receive the exception if the client cannot connect? Um, the server will receive the exception from the kernel if uh, the client sends a message mm -hmm. where a capability is in that I don't know yet. Okay. And the kernel tries to create a local name for me, a capability <coughs> for me, me as server, but it has not enough code out for me. It has to send a quota first. Okay, but it can send a quota without sending a packet. That's, 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 I, I, the quota must be uh, spent to the kernel. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I understand your question right. <laughs> uh, can you make some analogy with Ken with, with a hypervisor and, and a guest for this memory location? Uh, what, what did you say? Like server clients, Ken, yes. VM guest. Like this analogy yeah, it's, it's, with a quota, would it uh, be easier to...? Uh, it's, it's the same for, for uh, a hypervisor and just in this point of view. So the quota always comes from the hypervisor for the guest, and if the guest acquires something more, because uh, we have to go and the yes. and all that. Yes. So um, Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe you normally can try to clarify this question. Is, I think it's a little bit more used to uh, hypervisors. So, 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 the, so each, uh, each component in the system has a certain function of quota, and uh, there is a protocol that allows uh, components to trade this quota between the components. So if you have a server and a client, and at a point when the client wants to do, have something, use some service from the server, it opens a connection to the server, and, and with this connection, it, is, it spends a, or it donates a bit of its own quota, a bit of the client's quota. But this is something that goes out of band of this uh, RPC that we are talking here. So this has already ha happened. So the client has donated some of its own quota to the server, and so the server knows now. Okay, this particular client has has given me uh, this amount of memory, and so the, the server can say spend to the kernel. Okay, now I am I'm spending the kernel a bit more of my quota. So that we are counting the client. But the, the concept between the kernel and the component is the topic that Martin is talking about. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, there are no more pressing questions. I'd like to end the talk.